Hello, and welcome to the first episode of the Bravosi broadcast. My name is Erin, also known as Fake Aria in the forums, and I'm here with my rat cook, Evan, aka Solo Siren. We have started this channel in effort to explore a different side to our favorite literature, specifically relating to food. This gives us a chance to explore symbolism and fun details that may be otherwise overlooked and really opens up new opportunity for discussion. We will be incorporating literary inspired cooking into our episodes, so it should be a lot of tasty fun. Our main focus will be on the series A Song of Ice and Fire by George R. R. Martin, but we will on occasion dive into cuisine and analysis from other works. Today we'll be taking a closer look at John chapter 6 from A Dance with Dragons. It's an ominous chapter with plenty of foreshadowing to John's betrayal by the Night's Watch. We will examine how the wildlings are living as refugees south of the wall at Molestown and the relationship they have with the Night's Watch and Jon Snow. We'll take a look at how the wildlings are surviving, their lifestyle, and their diet. There's a noticeable shift in the alliances between Jon Snow, the men of the Night's Watch, and the wildlings unfolding here, and loyalties are stretched. Later, we'll be attempting a meal challenge that the wildlings might face themselves. Let's dive in and we'll uncover more details. In the previous few chapters, we have seen the wildlings permitted south of the Wall by Lord Commander Jon Snow and King Stannis Baratheon at the Wall. The wildlings are seeking safety and sanctuary and mass south of the Wall to escape the coming winter cold and the others that come with it. After the battle at Castle Black, the king beyond the Wall, Mance Raider, was taken prisoner and executed by Melisandre and King Stannis. Stannis and Mance came to an agreement after the wildlings lost the battle. Though Mance refused to bend the knee, he sacrificed himself to the fire to save his people and secure their passage south. Melisandre made the wildlings pledge to the Lord of Light and forsake the old gods as part of the arrangement. The Night's Watch supply stores were sorely depleted with the presence of Stannis' men, and now the Black Brothers find themselves obligated to help thousands more who have passed south and they are ultimately responsible for, especially now that Stannis has moved south to seek out Winterfell and fight the Boltons. The Wildlings have set up camp at Molestown for the time being. Several men of the Night's Watch, including Lord Commander Jon Snow and his Lord Steward, Bowen Marsh, are heading to Molestown to distribute food to the Wildlings who have set up camp there. Bowen and First Builder Othel Yarwick are the two officers serving under Jon at Castle Black. They have expressed great disdain for the mission to help the Wildlings, and their hatred goes bone deep. Bowen is described to us as a round, red man who is good with numbers. He is loyal to the Watch and has served for many years. After Lord Commander Mormont was killed, Bowen served as Castellan at Castle Black prior to the election for a new Lord Commander. He was nominated, but lost, then supported Janice Slint, who ultimately lost to John. The morning they are to set out, Bowen Marsh starts the day by reminding John this errand is foolish and folly, even bringing up Lord Commander Mormont in an attempt to drive his point home. John quickly cuts him off, reminding him that Lord Commander Mormont is dead, and not by the hands of wildlings, but by his own men, sworn brothers. Pomegranates. All those seeds. A man could choke to death. I'd sooner have a turnip. Never knew a turnip to do a man any harm. The old pomegranate is, of course, the nickname of Bowen Marsh. Later in the story, Bowen is a conspirator in John's murder for the Watch. Bowen is the second attacker, the first being Wick Whittlestick, who cuts John's throat and leaves him choking for air as Bowen stabs him in the gut. Bowen leads the riders and wagons through the snowy forest south of Castle Black on the road to Molestown. John rides with Ed Tollett. Along the way, they see several trees with faces carved into them in the fashion of the old gods. This would not please Lady Melisandre. John knew it would be no easy thing to get the wildlings to give up their gods and advises Ed to make sure the watch doesn't tell her. Ed thinks she'll see it in her fires, but John isn't convinced and dismisses it, thinking about whoever carved the faces easily eluded his sentries. 
They arrived to Molestown to find a thousand wildlings living in quarters suited to house a hundred. They are hungry, cold, crowded, and dirty. John observes the watchman, acting disgusted of them, but he knows the people are simply surviving at this point and aren't to be feared. The Black Brothers began to pass out food. They'd brought slabs of hard salt beef, dried cod, dried beans, turnips, carrots, sacks of barley meal and wheat and flour, pickled eggs, barrels of onions and apples. You can have an onion or an apple, John heard Harry Howe tell one woman. But not both. You gotta pick. Despite the grumblings and requests of the wildlings, they are each only granted an apple or an onion and other basic fare provided by the watch. Some bickering and shoving breaks out, resulting in the aforementioned woman dropping her food and spilling her flour into the snow. This creates further disruption amongst the wildlings and tension among the watchmen. John uses the opportunity, calling for a horn blast to calm the crowd. He appeals to the wildlings. We're feeding you as best we can, as much as we can spare. Apples, onions, neeps, carrots, there's a long winter ahead for all of us, and our stores are not inexhaustible. You crows eat good enough, Halleck shoved forward. For now, we hold the wall. The wall protects the realm, and you, now. John goes on to remind the wildlings why they came south to begin with, and the foe to the north, dead things with blue eyes and black hands. The wall and the night's watch protect them now. You want more food? asked John. The food's for fighters. Help us hold the wall, and you'll eat as well as any crow. Or as poorly, when the food runs short. The wildlings don't like the sound of it. Many refuse it, accusing the watch of starving them and now trying to enslave them. A dozen voices all began to speak at once. The thens were shouting in the old tongue. A little boy began to cry. John Snow waited until all of it had died down, then turned to Harry Howe and said, Howe, what was it you told this woman? Howe looked confused. About the food, you mean? An apple or an onion? That's all I said. They gotta pick. You have to pick, John Snow repeated. All of you. No one is asking you to take our vows, and I do not care what gods you worship. My own gods are the old gods, the gods of the north. But you can keep the red god or the seven, or any other god who hears your prayers. It's spears we need, bows, eyes along the wall. John offers to take the wounded and crippled, the old and infirm, spear wives, boys and girls as young as twelve. There were many tasks to complete at the wall, from gathering firewood to milking goats to training and fighting. They would have to obey a captain's orders, but John would never force them to kneel. The choice is yours, John Snow told them. Those who want to help us hold the wall, return to Castle Black with me and I'll see you armed and fed. The rest of you, get your turnips and your onions and crawl back inside your holes. John remembers Mance telling him the wildlings will follow strength, they follow the man. Slowly but surely, several come forward to join them. Those wildlings saw the bravery and courage it took to do all that John has done so far, then trust the wildlings to work with the watch. They are still human and all have a common goal. John will protect them and will work with them. No Thens joined, but they received the support of Halleck, brother to harm a dog's head, that fearsome female wildling warrior who led a pack of boars. John did notice there were no boars present and suspects they were likely eaten. Halleck was a man of note, and when he gives his approval, it comes with the support of his cousins and men who followed his sister. They leave 63 stronger than when they arrived. On the return ride, Bowen again questions John about what his plan will be for the wildlings. John explains that he will have them man the newly opened towers along the wall that King Stannis ordered him to reopen and guard. He plans to open Hardin's Tower for the 19 women who joined them, 
so they are not intermingled and more vulnerable to the men of questionable repute. Bowen expresses concern for the women, for feeding extra mouths, for arming wildlings, and for whose side they'll stay on come Tormund Giantsbane or the Weeper to the gate. John simply answers, then we'll know. We would like to explore a few of the foods that are directly used in this chapter. Their uses are deliberate when you explore the symbolic meaning behind them. Onions can be used to convey revelation and unveiling discovery. Onions are layered, so with each layer unfolding, we are getting closer to the heart of the subject. Sir Davos Seaworth is known as the Onion Knight, and I think we can all agree that the man has layers. He is a smuggler, a sailor, a hand to two kings, Stannis and John in the show. He is also a father and husband. He's also basically the best uncle type dude ever to Shireen, Gendry, Lyanna Mormont, and Jon Snow. He even shows compassion and takes time to try and understand Patchface. Apples are the symbol for knowledge, immortality, temptation, and the sin and fall of man. It is common to impart the apple as the fruit eaten in the Garden of Eden by Adam and Eve, giving them the knowledge of good and evil. It's even said that the apple is a tool used in the Bible as an evolutionary symbol. In the Old Testament, it symbolizes the fall of man, but in the New Testament it is shown for redemption and rebirth. There's artwork such as the Madonna using apples as representatives of rebirth. With this in mind, one could wonder if we see any apple symbolism in the future with John's assumed resurrection. The pomegranate is a symbol for righteousness and knowledge in the Jewish religion. It's said to be sacred because it has 613 seeds, which corresponds to the 613 commandments of the Torah. This is a great nickname for Bowen Marsh because with the plans of the mutiny, you can definitely connect him to an air of righteousness. It's also known that Bowen is a man very good with numbers, so to have a fruit symbolically linked to a specific number is just a clever little touch by George. We can see George took care in the foods he selected, adding yet another layer to his story. He is strongly hinting at some hidden knowledge that we need to unveil. We do know Jon Snow knows nothing, and he's not going to figure this out before he gets himself killed. Bowen, our pomegranate character, is a righteous and intelligent man, but he fails to embrace the evolution of the Night's Watch under a younger man. With the undertones of this chapter, we can see something dark is on the horizon. There are several houses in Westeros that use apples or onions in their heraldry. House Seaworth show a black ship on a gray field with an onion on the sail. This, of course, is the heraldry belonging to Sir Davos, the Onion Knight. House Appleton of Appleton has a quartered sigil, an apple tree on yellow, and a gatehouse on white. House Fossaway of Cider Hall has a red apple on yellow as their sigil. This senior branch of the Fossaway family is known as the Red Apple Fossaways. The sigil for House Fossaway of New Barrel show a green apple on yellow. This junior branch of the family is known as the Green Apple Fossaways. They split off from the Fossaways of Cider Hall when cousins clashed during the tourney at Ashford Meadow, detailed in the Duncan Egg novella the Hedge Knight. Stefan was a younger cousin who sided with Dunk in the Battle of Seven after Dunk had unknowingly assaulted Prince Arian Targaryen for attacking a puppeteer. The fight was outnumbered and Stefan was knighted minutes prior to fighting in the melee. His cousin Raymond went to the other side and fought against Dunk, Stefan, and the other five knights. Sir Stephen painted a green apple on his shield and said though he was still green, he'd rather be green than rotten. House Merryweather of Long Table show a horn of plenty on their sigil depicting apples, onions, carrots, turnips, leeks, 
and plums. Owen Merriweather was hand to King Eris for two years. His grandson, Orton Merriweather, serves as the justiciar, then is named Queen Cersei's hand. His wife, Lady Taina, is lady in waiting to Cersei, and they become quite close. Orton resigns as hand after Cersei's imprisonment and heads back to Long Table with his wife and son. With both apples and onions present in their sigil, we question the extent of their ambitions and if they've gained knowledge for any specific purpose. House Rowan of Golden Grove show a golden apple tree on silver. They are a prominent first men house with origins tracing back to Garth Greenhand. Garth's daughter Rowan Goldtree founded their house. Her legend states she was so heartbroken when her lover left her, she wrapped one of her long golden hairs around an apple and planted it upon a hill. From the apple grew a tree with golden bark, leaves, and fruit. For any Tolkien lovers, this seems to be a nod to the Malorn trees that grow in Lothlorien and Galadriel, the High Elf. Her hair was beautiful silver gold. When the Fellowship visited Lothlorien, she gifted three strands of hair to Gimli, for though he was a dwarf, he loved Lady Galadriel and she saw that his heart was pure. The Malorn trees grow only in Lothlorien. It has silver bark and golden leaves ever in bloom. The leaves that fall from the tree glitter golden on the ground. Galadriel gives Samwise Gamgee a seed in some fertile, magical soil from the ground where the tree grows. The seed later grows to be the new party tree after the scourge of the Shire by Saruman. The only thing in common between the houses who bear an apple in their heraldry is that they're all from the Reach. Whether this has more to do with location and agriculture than with any specific meaning is something only George knows for now, but it is a fun bit of symbolism that can hint to other players' motivations. We decided to recreate a challenge that the wildlings would face with their limited ingredients they're provided. We wrote out the foods that the Night's Watch provided, put them in a bucket, and we each drew four ingredients to use to try and come up with the best meal we could with what we were given. Uh, the foods that were listed out were dried beans, dried beef and salt cod, carrots, leeks, turnips, wheat and flour, barley meal, pickled eggs, and either the apple or the onion. We did also include bacon because Harm a Dog's Head's boars were obviously killed for food, so that was our fun bonus ingredient because everyone loves bacon. So first we flipped a coin for the apple or the onion. I got the apple, Evan got the onion. Um, she also drew dried beans, barley meal, and bacon, lucky. And then I drew um, salt beef, carrots, and wheat and flour, and the apple. So I came up with an apple cider vinegar roast beef. Um, salt beef is gross and kind of hard to come by, so I used a chuck roast. Um, I also added a couple of potatoes in my recipe because I have children, they love potatoes, so gotta make sure they eat. Um, apple cider vinegar would be really easy to make. Vinegar is very easy to make and it's probably something the wildlings use for cleaning, medicinal purposes, and cooking. Um, and then I also included leeks in my recipe because I couldn't use onion and I would have definitely used that in real life. Um, but leeks are delicious and they smell incredible so that was a really fun first time use of them and then I used the wheat and flour to make a nice gravy at the end.
So my dish was pretty economical. I sauteed two pieces of bacon in a cast iron pot until they were pretty crispy, then took the bacon out and added sliced onions. And I just cooked those onions in the grease for about 20 minutes until they were pretty well caramelized. And then I added some chickpeas and covered it with water and just let that all simmer together for about four hours. And the end result was just like a, a really comforting hot onion broth essentially with a little bit of chickpea protein in there. And I thickened it with um, about a teaspoon of barley meal. So as you can see, our goal is to make different themed meals inspired by the text. There are countless meals and foods detailed by George R. R. Martin, and it gives us many opportunities to try new things and share them with you. We hope you enjoyed these cooking videos and maybe get some ideas for feeding your own wildlings. Thank you for joining us today. In our next videos, we will be exploring pies and lies, golden wine, sister stew, and not one, but two chickens. If you have any ideas for recipes for us to cook up, please leave us a comment below. Please give our video a like and subscribe to our channel and hit that notification bell. We'll give it a ring when dinner's ready. We are on Facebook and part of the group Geek Chat One, so please find us and follow us there as well. Thank you.